time is difficult. Time is a, a course of innumerable bugs in programming. The reason why it's difficult, basically, is that there's more than one thing that we call time. And we've only relatively recently learned this. We haven't quite caught on all, all of the ramifications. By relatively recently, I mean the 1890s. <laughs> and up, up until 1890, uh, it, it was all like, nice and simple. The, the most stable clock anyone knew about was the rotating Earth. Uh, in particular, with decent pendulum clocks in the Victorian era, uh, we were all using mean solar time. And the International Meridian Conference in 1884 decided on the Greenwich Meridian, passing through the, uh, the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, uh, as being the international prime meridian. So, mean solar time on the Greenwich Meridian, that is Greenwich mean time, is the standard form of time uh, for the entire Earth. Uh, and we still use it today, although the, the term Greenwich mean time is actually deprecated. Uh, in, in 1928, it was deprecated because, uh, partly because it's parochial, but also there was a, a technical ambiguity in, in, its, in its definition. So ever since 1928, the third term has been universal time. Uh, anyway, uh, the, what happened in, in the 1890s was the, the Canadian astronomer Simon Newcomb uh, was, was trying to produce improved tables of ephemerides. Uh, ephemerides are, are, are tables showing uh, what which astronomical bodies you expect to appear in the sky, where and when, and, and uh, uh, they were, were very important for navigation. So um, improving them was, uh, was a, an important task. So he looked at uh, about 150 years worth of observations, ranging from about 1750 to 1890, uh, and, and he produced a, a much finer mathematical theory of motion of the planets, especially the inner planets, uh, than had ever existed before. Uh, and uh, comparing this against reality, however, it, it, it didn't match up, not quite. Uh, he found that the, the planets were behaving perfectly as his theory said, relative to each other, but they were doing it at the wrong time. <laughs> um, and eventually he figured out well, he reckoned there wasn't anything actually wrong with his theory. There was something wrong with time. <laughs> there, were, there was something wrong with his time coordinate, which, of course, was universal time. And uh, that was a radical idea at the time. Um, and we now know he, he was spot on. Um, he, he was seeing, on, on a decade time scale, the, uh, the rate of universal time being slightly non-uniform. Um, of course, he couldn't measure it directly at the time. Uh, but uh, he, he, he had managed to detect it by being the, the first person in history to have access to a clock more stable than the rotating Earth. Unfortunately, his clock was the solar system, which is a bit unwieldy. <laughs> you want to read this clock, you have to make very precise astronomical observations. If you need an observatory, you can't put it on your wrist. <laughs> um, so, it, it, was, it, it didn't immediately displace universal time. Uh, in, in fact, it was several decades before anyone started actually using it as a clock. So, um, it, eventually, in the 1940s, astronomers figured um, universal time was no longer enough for their purposes. They did actually need something uh, more stable, and they started using um, uh, the uh, time based on uh, planetary motion. They called it ephemeris time. And, and, and the way it works, is you make the observations, um, it, and, then, and then you put it into Newcomb's theory of planetary motion, but you run the theory backwards. Normally, you, you put in a time coordinate, and you get out what you're meant to see. But um, with this, you, you put in what you've seen, and you get out when you should have seen it. You, you get out a time that is supposedly in universal time, but because universal time is actually non-uniform, it doesn't quite match the real universal time when you did this. Um, but they, they said, oh, okay, we do, we do, never mind that it doesn't match up with universal time. That is definitively the time in the ephemeris time. Uh, and, and so if ephemeris time is it, it, it effectively, um, uh, the, 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 uh, it's, it's a more stable time, and it, it's um, the, the time that you would get by, it's, you get by extrapolating from Newcomb's observations. Um, so, uh, yes, it, it, it has, of course, because Newcomb's theory thinks it's using a universal time coordinate, uh, it uses the notation of universal time. It divides time up into days, hours, minutes, and seconds. 
And so ephemeris times refers to time in days, hours, minutes, and seconds. But there's a fundamental difference between this and universal time, that the, the day of ephemeris time doesn't refer to any natural cycle. It's not the Earth rotating once or anything like that. There is nothing that happens based on, on the ephemeris time day. It's just a period of time. Um, so, so it's uh, an oddity of nomenclature. nomenclature. It's um, misleading. Uh, but but that's, that's what we have. Uh, and of course, ephemeris time has been diverging from universal time we've seen. Um, so for, for anyone who's not an astronomer, uh, things, things changed uh, really, uh, from the, working back from the 1890s, things changed uh, when the technology for artificial clocks got better. Uh, in 1921, pendulum clocks went electromechanical. The, the best electromechanical pendulum clock um, was accurate to a few milliseconds per day. Very good for a mechanical device. Uh, and, and that was precise enough uh, to, to measure some non-uniformity in universal time. It actually measured seasonal variations in the rate of the Earth's rotation. And, and then in, in uh, 1927, uh, we, we got quartz clocks, which were more stable still. And uh, the, the, this, this was able to measure variations from week to week. Uh, and, and then, of course, in the 1950s, we finally got atomic clocks. The theory had been around for ages, and people had built some atomic clocks that didn't actually work very well. In 1955, <laughs> the, the National Physical Laboratory in the UK uh, built the, the world's first cesium atomic clock. Uh, the, way, the way this works is they have a, a cesium-based uh, maser, and uh, that, that gives a very standard frequency, and you just count periods of radiation. So, so they built this, and uh, also among the early adopters were astronomers, uh, and they, they figured, oh, oh, right, it, it's, it's an improvement on the, the quartz clocks, it's a, it's a very stable clock. We can use this to interpolate between observations of ephemeris time. So they, they use it as a real-time realization of ephemeris time, which at the time was, was, was the predominant astronomical time scale. But, but they realized they, they, they were, um, uh, this, this was a bit unfair on the atomic clock. They, everyone, everyone realized from the start this is actually uh, more stable than ephemeris time. So everyone wanted a time scale based on the atomic clock. Um, so, of course, they, they, for continuity, they had to measure the frequency, get, uh, work, work out the frequency so that they could actually work that the other way around. Um, and, uh, of course, they need first to compare it against the most stable uh, time, uh, time scale that, uh, that was available, which was ephemeris time. So it's been all. <coughs> so they, they spent three years on this, from late 1955 to mid 1958. Uh, they made the very precise astronomical observations required for ephemeris time and timed them all with atomic clocks. And um, after these three years, they had measured very precisely the frequency of the radiation that they were getting from the cesium atoms in terms of ephemeris time. And then they, they worked that theory backwards as well to define an atomic second. So um, here are the definitions of the second that have, have applied various times. In the 19th century, um, when, when the metric system was first devised, no one thought it necessary to explicitly define the second. <laughs> so it was just tacitly accepted as being uh, part of mean solar time. That, that was the state of the art. Then in 1960, oh, we've got, a, we've got a bit of a lag here. The atomic second had already been defined by 1960, but then we get this definition of the ephemeris second. Um, what's going on here is that the General Conference on Weights and Measures is very conservative. The, there's a big lag on any new development uh, getting into the fundamental definitions. Anyway, 19, 1960 was the year that the, the metric system was further formalized as the International System of Units, SI. And uh, so, so they, they, they picked the ephemeris second there. Um, and then in 1967, finally, we, we've got the uh, atomic second chosen as the standard second. And then 30 years after that, the, the definition was refined uh, because the temperature of the clocks was making a, a difference to the readings. They said, temperature of zero Kelvin at absolute zero. No one actually runs the clocks at absolute zero, of course, but we, we can model the effects of temperature and, and uh, correct for it. Okay, so, so that's the atomic second. The, the other ingredient we need 
Uh, <laughs> no, that's can't be ten minutes at this point. Sometimes you talk rifles. Sorry. starting point in a way of counting and uh, of course the, sort of, the way you run an atomic clock basically is, is you count um, rate periods of, of this radiation and you could just say well here's our starting point this is zero and count the periods of the radiation and say well there's n periods of radiation <laughs> further on uh, or of course with the atomic second defined we can say well so many seconds long um, but, but they didn't do that uh, they, they instead adopted something very similar to what ephemeris time had done. They, again, divided time up into days, hours, minutes, and seconds. Um, so we have the, the, the atomic second implicitly defines an atomic day of 86,400 atomic seconds. Again, it's not a natural cycle. It's just a period of time. Uh, but, uh, so, um, so it's a bit misleading again. Uh, so anyway, so they needed uh, a starting point, and they... they they could, in principle, have tried to synchronize it with ephemeris time, but that would be very awkward. So instead, they synchronized it with universal time. Uh, retrospectively, uh, atomic time, atomic time scale, which we now know as international atomic time, though it, it, it didn't gain that name until 1971, um, they, they retrospectively synchronized it with universal time at the beginning of 1958, and. Um, since then, it's just counted atomic seconds, and of course, it's diverged from universal time. Um, now, if you were to just count seconds, we're, we're, we've almost reached 1.7 billion seconds. It, 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 the milestone is reaching a couple of days' time. We all have time tea parties about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, so that's that's uh, that's atomic time. Um, the, the the next thing I need to talk about is radio time signals. Uh, it's, it's about the dissemination of time. It's a very, very important aspect of a time scale. Uh, the first radio time signal started in, in 1905. And of course, they were using the best technology the, at the time, which was pure mechanical pendulum clocks. Uh, and they, they synchronized them to universal time, but of course, had to keep adjusting them to keep them synchronized. Uh, and, and, and as the clock technology improved, they, um, they, they adopted the new technology. And, and by the time they got to uh, to using atomic clocks, they, it, things had things changed around. Instead of having to keep adjusting the clock to keep it accurate, now the clock's more accurate than the universal time that they want to transmit. So, so to, to keep adjusting it, to worsen it, this would be perverse. So, um, in, a, in a rather radical mood, the National Bureau of Standards in the US uh, started, started in 1956, they, this before the atomic second had been defined, uh, they, they took uh, an atomic oscillator, uh, calibrated it to tick uh, seconds of universal time at, at the length they were at the time, and then, and then they left it, let it run, and let it drift away from UT. And when it got far enough away, far enough for them to notice, um, they, they put in a jump. They, they jumped the, the time signal by 20 milliseconds. Uh, and they, they, they went on using a lot of these small jumps, and uh, less frequently, changing the, the frequency to match how universal time had changed. Uh, and all, all of this was controversial at the time, uh, but the, the other time bureaus quickly recognized that, that this was actually a much better way of, uh, of managing things. And furthermore, they, they had the option, they, they, they could synchronize the, um, their, their time signals with each other much more precisely than they could synchronize to universal time. Uh, and after the, the, the atomic Second had been fine after we had uh, international atomic time started. Uh, so, uh, an international agreement was reached on what time scale ought to be broadcast. And, and what they agreed was they would use uh, an offset, they, um, they would transmit a, a, a frequency that's slightly offset from the atomic frequency. They would offset it by a nice brown number in uh, atomic second, essentially atomic hertz. And um, they, they would introduce jumps of 50 milliseconds at a time, uh, but only, only at the end of a month. And they would only change frequency at the end of the year. And this is what they did. Um, so th this is the service that um, it became known as Coordinated Universal Time, uh, UTC, which is a term we still know today. 
Um, it started out in 1961, 15 parts per billion slower than, uh, than atomic time, and they formed a leap in July, and then they changed the frequency at the end of the year. Uh, they, they quickly decided that 50 milliseconds was fairly small, and uh, they switched to 100 millisecond jumps, which they had positive and negative jumps over here for some years. And uh, it's in 1967 that this became formally known as UTC. Um, but the, the, some inconveniences showed up in this. Uh, having, the, having the frequency offset was actually really inconvenient. Um, if, if you could, it meant, it meant they have two seconds that are of the slightly different values. And they've got, they've got two important frequencies to deal with in, in transmitting the signal. There's the, uh, the time, the, the period of the second markers, and also the carrier frequency. And of course, the carrier frequency needs to be a fixed frequency, so that, that, that uses the atomic standard purely. But then the, um, the second markers are, are more like universal time, they're at this offset. And, and, and that, that's awkward. It would be really nice if you could phase lock the two together. And so they said, why don't we drop the frequency offset, just use the atomic frequency, uh, and rely entirely on jumps? Uh, and of course, if they don't that, they're going to be jumping a lot more than they were before. <laughs> So, 100 milliseconds is a bit small, but let's do whole second jumps. And so this is what they did, starting in 1972. End of 1971, they needed this irregular jump um, in, in, order, in order to get UTC to an integer number of seconds offset from TAI. And from then on, they used pure atomic frequency and whole second jumps. And the jumps were only in uh, June <laughs> and December. Uh, and that's what we know as leap seconds. And this is the form of UTC that's still going today. Uh, and I'll show you, let's look at those jumps in a little more detail. You can see how awkward this was. The, the jumps are all nice round numbers of atomic seconds, but in UTC seconds, how long was this day in UTC? Awkward. <laughs> 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 um, so so that's, uh, that's what time is being broadcast today. What happens if you actually want universal time today? Well. Um, if, you, if you're actually interested in how the Earth is rotating, um, first of all, the, the term UT, universal time, is no longer sufficient. We've got multiple forms of UT, not least UTC. Um, the primary form, if you just want uh, mean solar time on the prime meridian, it's called UT1. And um, then if you want any detail about it, you ask the International Earth Rotation Service. Actually, <laughs> 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 imagine a bunch of nerds standing at the North Pole with a big handle. <laughs> um, and every week, they, they publish a bulletin, something like this, which tells you how the Earth has been rotating in the past week. This is the current one. X, X and Y here are polar, it's about polar motion. The, um, the this crust wobbles slightly, it, it, it's, uh, the axis of rotation is in, in a consistent place. Uh, but the, the main rotational part is described over here. It's described as a difference between UT1 and UTC. UTC is a, is a convenient reference point here because um, for, for this purpose, it's essentially an atomic time scale. It's effectively measuring actual time. Uh, and it, it's, a, it's a convenient reference point here because it's tracking UT1. So this difference remains quite small. Uh, it, it's, it's required to, to stay under 0.9 seconds in either direction. So you can see that this is changing. We're, um, was it? It's changing by about a millisecond per day at the moment. Um, yeah. Uh, th so th that's th that's what was measured over the past week. And they, in addition to this, they published predictions a year ahead. Um, they, they internally they predict a lot further ahead than this. This is all they publish. Um, so here we've, we've got we've got X and Y again, and here's how. We, uh, UT1 is evolving, and you can see that by this time next year, we, we're really going to be due for another leap second. Um, we, we will have it at the end of 2012, if not uh, in June 2012. Um, whether we'll actually have it at the other state, we don't, we don't yet know, because the, the IRS decides, and they haven't decided yet, or at least they haven't told us. Every six months, they publish something like this. Um, and they're only considering June and December, uh, and every six months they, they mail out this to say well, there's going to be a jump at the next opportunity. This is the last one they published, which tells there won't be a jump at the end of 2011 uh, for 
June 2012, they haven't decided, we'll find out sometime in January. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's how you deal with universal time. That should be everything. Oh, except there's a complication that I haven't mentioned yet. <laughs> I've, I've implicitly assumed throughout all of this that time is the same for everyone. <laughs> but <laughs> some time in ephemeris time or atomic time or, uh, or, or, or a duration, as, as long as I'm specifying which time scale it's on, I've, I've assumed that it's the same for everyone. But since the work of Einstein, we know that it's not. <laughs> the, now, I've got, the, the, since his um, theory of relativity, first published in 1905, we, we know that the, the time you experience depends on your motion and your altitude. Um, and this, this became noticed in, the, in, in international atomic time in the 1970s. They found that the clocks there are a couple of hundred clocks contributing to atomic time uh, in meteorological laboratories all over the world. And they found they're all, they're all talking, ticking at different rates. Not because of any flaw in the clocks, but simply because they're at different altitudes. And so a decision had to be made about which altitude atomic time would pretend to be at. <laughs> and they decided they were going to standardize on mean sea level. So all the clocks that are not at mean sea level, that's all of them, <laughs> to pretend to be at sea level. They're all above sea level, which means they tick a little bit faster than a clock would be. So, so they artificially retard the signal uh, and, 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 and average all of those. Separate. And I suppose that's sea level as defined by the gravity field, not the average. Oh, yes, yes, it is. Sea level as defined by the gravity field. There's actually, it's, it's even more interesting than that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's why it's going to be slightly helpful. <laughs> If you're dealing with time scales in a modern way, if you're concerned only with the Earth, then you only need to handle this, this stuff. If, <laughs> if you go outside the Earth, we need more of these slides. We need another dimension or something. On the left-hand side here, we've got physical time. Um, the purest for this, uh, these two are theoretical ideal time scales. So, coordinate time. Geocentric coordinate time, TCG. This is... Um, the time that would be taken by a theoretical ideal clock that's moving with the Earth, but located at infinite altitude. So it's completely outside the gravity well. So it's just slightly faster than anything you'll really get. If you're dealing with satellites in Earth orbit, that's your reference point. <laughs> then we have terrestrial time, TT. This is theoretical ideal time ticked, that would be ticked by a clock at mean sea level on the rotating Earth. Now, originally, um, well, th these two are, well, according to theory, they're, they're linearly re related. They dif differ only by a, a, a constant difference in, in frequency. Um, now, originally, TT was defined as being at mean sea level, and if you wanted to know the relationship between them, you had to go to mean sea level, make a measurement of the uh, gravitational potential there, uh, and, and thus you measure the, the difference in, in rate between them. But they, they've reversed that theory as well now, because we got so good at measuring time that we could measure it better than we could measure sea level. <laughs> so, so, now, so now there is an exact value, of, it's about 12 digits long, describing the difference in rate between TCG and TT. And um, they, this implicitly defines sea level in terms of a, a, a time dilation. <laughs> okay, and that was just the theoretical idea. Down here we get to some actual hardware. <laughs> International atomic time is, is our uh, attempt to realise terrestrial time with actual atomic clocks. Of course it's imperfect and uh, you, you can get better approximations to TT after the fact. Over here on the right hand side we, we've got um, uh, Earth rotation. The purest form of Earth rotation is rotation relative to distant stars, which is, is historically called sidereal time, uh, and the modern form of it is called Earth Rotation Angle, ERA. Um, this is the first time scale in history to honestly admit that it's not time. <laughs> <laughs> you have to remember, these are not time, they're angle. So, mean solar time, like we've talked about, this is rotation relative to the sun, uh, and then here are some other forms of UT, because um, it before we had ferrous time and so on, it, it, it looked useful to subtract out <laughs> the um, predictable components of the irregularity of UT1 and get slightly more regular timescales. 
Uh, but we, we, we hardly use those at all these days. Uh, then down at the bottom, we have something that's a mixture of the two. We have a uh, coordinated universal time, so called because it coordinates the seconds of atomic time with the days of universal time. Uh, and that, that's <laughs> So, yes, that, that, those are all the things you really need to know about if you're dealing with Terran time scales. Um, <laughs> 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 uh, other so, uh, a couple of things. The smooth bit. Sorry? There was a smooth bit of the oxide. You, or oh, uh, yeah, I'm just glancing over there. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is essentially the... I had to cut this talk down so much to, to fit it into a 20-minute time slot for Yeti in Europe. Um, so, today, I, I booked a, a longer time slot so that I could give the same 20-minute material and then an extended question session, which is what we're now entering. Um, because at, at Yeti, I ended up getting a lot of questions and ran hugely over... Um, over time, but fortunately, <laughs> fortunately I was only going to a coffee break, so uh, I thought we'd do it in an organized fashion. So, I'm open to questions. You, you can ask about things that are on this, you can ask about anything I've talked about, and if we run out of questions, then we go to the roulette wheel. <laughs> question first. Smooth coordination, yeah. So UTC is a bit awkward to handle because um, most of its days are 86,400 seconds long, but some of them are 86,401 seconds long. Uh, and and there, are lo there are a lot of things with the inbuilt assumption that you'll get 24 hours or 60 minutes or 60 seconds. Um, if, if you want to maintain uh, 86,400 seconds every day, you have to fudge it somehow. And the, there are various ways you can fudge it. You, you, can, you can just lose, which a lot of code does. Um, or you, you, can, you can use UT1, uh, or, or you, can, you can handle the, the leap second. You, 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 could use a, you could use atomic time, which um, gives you nominal days, but it, it, it's not synchronized to UT. Uh, or this scheme uh, is used, you fudge the, the leap seconds in, in an organized way. So, in UTC, UTC SLF, it's not UTC with smooth leap seconds. Um, the, 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 this scheme is, uh, every day from the inside appears to have exactly 86,400 seconds, but some of them are longer than others. <laughs> Most of the time, it ticks in perfect synchrony with UTC, but when there's a leap second, um, it spreads that leap second over the last thousand seconds of the day. So when it's positive leap second, the last thousand seconds are slightly longer than they ought to be. Um, so you get the nominal number of seconds it's telling you, it does a well-defined transform between that and UTC. Uh, and the difference is small enough that you won't notice it in, in most situations. Also, it, it was um, recently announced that Google had done something uh, vaguely similar. Uh, they, they needed to handle leap seconds. They, um, it was too much work for them to handle it properly everywhere. They, they essentially needed to do a smooth thing, uh, but they, they did their own. They, they spread it over several hours, uh, and they, they used um, uh, they, they used a sinusoid to, to bring it in very smoothly. Because they, they, were, they were doing it by lying to the NTP servers, whereas UTC SLS uses a, a, a line segment to do it. Okay, so that's smooth leap seconds. Should we spin the wheel? Um, yeah. Technically, you can never sleep seconds long, but none of it ever happened yet. Yes, that's one of the things on this list. Um, okay. Right, negatively, actually, I can show you. One of, my, one of my slides over here showed there have been some negative leaps. Oh, yeah. In the, in the brother seconds era, this one and this one. And um, so a positive leap second is when you have an extra second tag on the day, and a negative leap second is when you skip a second at the end of the day. So in, in the leap seconds era, we haven't had any negative leap seconds. This is because the Earth is rotating consistently a bit slower than it did over, over the period of Newcomb's observation. So it's a bit slower than, than atomic time, so mostly you need positive leap seconds. But recently, actually, it's speeded up a bit. Um, so <laughs> we had a period of seven years without any leap second because, because, it, we're, we're, because we're running so close to the atomic frequency. Uh, and, and then it, it, it slowed down a bit again, but it, it's been on a speeding trend for the last few years. Uh, and, and there are some days that are actually um, that, that, that are, are shorter than the, uh, the atomic 
thing. Now, uh, the, the, um, the projections of, of UT1 that I showed you, um, the middle part that I, that I left out has, at some point, UT1 minus UTC uh, reversing its trend. Because there's a, there's a part, for part of the year, as, as the seasonal variations uh, build up, they, uh, for part of the year, they, the days are consistently shorter than, than the atomic dates. Uh, now, if this continues, then the average length over the year is going to get shorter than the atomic frequency. And if that, if that persists for a little bit of time, then we could need a negative leap setting. It, it's a bit of a race of that. Uh, against the, the long-term slowing trend and against the proposal to abolish leap seconds, which I can also talk about if you want. Uh, I, I have three questions. One of which was that proposal to abolish leap seconds. Another is, I suppose it's a good thing that there's now an, an independent definition of mean sea level. Because otherwise, uh, global warming will probably blow it out of water. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the thing they say about daylight saving time. Can can you teach cows to read a, a wristwatch, um, and can we teach the sea to measure time dilation? Probably not. Um, so we, we've got an independent definition of a. a I, 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 I've fudged the terminology a little bit. It's it, it, it's a level that we historically referred to as mean sea level, but nowadays we, we call it the geoid. It, it's just it's just a notional plane. Well, it's a notional constant level of gravitational potential. Um, <laughs> it's it's not quite the shape we used to think it is. Bumpy. Um, what's your third question? Uh, are there any pole modules? Pole modules. We want the wheel. Pointed. Oh, oh. oh. <laughs> this uh, time UTC. This is my strict handling of leap seconds. Um, Data, I, I don't really want to rant about models, but um, <laughs> then one, of the, one, of, one of my issues with date time is that um, it, it thinks it knows about leap seconds, but it, it thinks it knows for sure that there won't be any in the future, and that's wrong. Um, with time UTC, if you ask about a future time beyond the time that, that we know about, it'll say, I don't know. Of, of course, sometimes you do want to fudge it. Time UTC isn't for those things. Time UTC is when you, when you want to be uh, strictly correct. Uh, and so I'll go to uh, proposal to uh, abolish leap seconds. Um, this has been, it has been debated for many years, and there's a specific proposal that's going to be looked at, I think, in January. Um, and uh, they're doing it the wrong way. <laughs> uh, but if, if you want a time scale without leap seconds, you can already use it. International atomic time is there, or, or UT1 if that's what you need. And if you need continuity with current UTC, then, then fine, jump from UTC to uh, a constant offset from atomic time. Um, but you, you, can't, you can't really change UTC in that way. Um, there are lots of things that require something like UTC that uh, that approximates universal time. And if you stop <coughs> having leap seconds in UTC, then it will no longer approximate universal time. And it'll break all the things that have built that in. In fact, it won't be a form of universal time anymore. If you, if you want to do that sort of thing, fine, you can declare a new time scale, call it international time. That, that, that was a good proposal. Um, but we, we kind of need the existing UTC to exist. Or at least if it doesn't, then don't call anything else UTC. Um, Legal time in a lot of places is based on Greenwich Mean Time, uh, and if if you redefine UTC, then you, you'll no longer be able to use UTC as a practical uh, equivalent of, of legal time. Uh, so there's at least one group that has said if UTC drops the leap seconds officially, then they're going to continue announcing leap seconds in, equi in the equivalent manner. <laughs> <laughs> because it is a useful service. So, uh, so their socials will be on the... There's going to, there, there are going to be leap seconds from at least one group. We hope that one group will, um, will get consensus. Uh, it would be not rather convenient if the IRS did it. If, if for political reasons they can't you call it UTC, they, they can call it something else. Uh, I don't know. Um, but, no, Orthodox uh, time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but just, yeah, um, just abolishing leap seconds, no, you, can't, you, you just can't do it that way. So, okay, we've had a demand for the wheel. Alright. <laughs> 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 so, um, yeah, the thing I showed you about 
turn time, you, you could do you could do an equivalent for uh, for another planet. Um, actually, the first place you want to go beyond this um, is if you're dealing with interplanetary stuff, you want a, a nice uh, you want you want a coordinate time scale for the solar system as a whole. And that is, it's called barycentric coordinate time (TCB). <laughs> barycentric is, is, is the centre of gravity of the solar system, uh, and, and that runs a bit faster than uh, TCG. Uh, and if you compare them, they're, they're not simply linearly related. Uh, the rate at which TCG ticks, as viewed by TCB, varies over the course of the year as as the the Earth goes in and out of the sun's gravity well. <laughs> so it, it goes, TCG goes slowest at perihelion when it's closest to the sun, and faster at, at, at aphelion. Um, and, and then if you, if you want to go beyond that, you kind of want to, to construct all of this, or most of it, um, for another planet. And the, the most advanced case that we have so far is Mars, uh, where uh, I think we've got this one and nothing else. Um, we don't have any atomic clocks in a, in a Mars system. Um, we, we, we do have a good idea of mean solar time on Mars. Um, and uh, so, so we, it's, it's got a primary and it's got airy mean time, which is the equivalent of Greenwich mean time. Uh, it's na named after the astronomer Airy, who built the transit telescope at Greenwich. Um, so it, it, it's called Airy mean time, and it's also sometimes been called coordinated Mars time, MTC. But that, that's a total misnomer. It, it, it's, it's referring to UTC, but it doesn't have any of the features of UTC. It's just mean solar time. To, to, to get the, the Mars equivalent of UTC, which could be kind of useful, we, we need to have Mars coordinate time, uh, Mars uh, um, surface time, and an atomic realization of that. Um, we, we haven't needed those yet. Um, yes, in general, if, if you're dealing with anything off Earth, then you, you, the relativistic reference frame is important. You have to be clear about whose time you're measuring. Um, well, once, you, once you've got that, you get the theory there and, and uh, everything else has built, been built on that. Uh, more questions? So, uh, UTC says that the day is 86,400 seconds, or maybe uh, plus minus one. Yes. POSIX says that the day is 86,400 seconds. Yeah. POSIX time. Okay. Yes. How do they correlate? How, how does POSIX time correlate with like UTC? Bad. <laughs> <laughs> When, when, they're, when they're devising the POSIX standard, we didn't have NTP in practice, we didn't have any, any of those things. Um, what was in practice happening was uh, computer clocks were set by the operator's wristwatch, which of course was roughly synchronized to, to UT, and you, you, you were lucky if, if it was in, within five minutes. Um, and, and so they fudged it. Um, well, you, you, can't, you can't blame Ken Thompson and that lot because leap seconds didn't exist when they devised it. Um, but but POSIX had to deal with it and they, they ducked the issue. They said that each day will be exactly 86,400 increments of, of POSIX time. Um, and and they, they specified a, an expression for time in terms of days, hours, minutes and seconds uh, of UTC. Uh, which, rather, which implies a, a uh, discontinuity around heat seconds. Officially what happens uh, is that the, the time increases as normal through the leap second uh, and, and the positive side at that point appears to be at the beginning of the next day. Then at the end of the leap second it jumps backwards by one to, to go normal again. So um, what I actually wrote, I, I wrote the, most of the current Wikipedia article on positive time and the, the way I expressed that was um, the POSIX time is so similar to a linear count of seconds that it is often mistaken for one. Of course, it was originally intended to be a linear count of seconds. It was also intended to be simply convertible with, with universal time, uh, and the two are in conflict. Um, and what, what, uh, what Unix does in practice uh, isn't what POSIX says. Uh, the, the NTP document says you, should, you get the discontinuity at the beginning of the leap second, repeat, the effect of repeat last second of the day. Uh, if you're using Linux, it doesn't do either of those. Uh, it, it waits until, uh, it, it, it triggers the change uh, at the beginning of the leap second, but doesn't actually walk the time backward until uh, a few milliseconds later. Uh, if, if you're very careful, if you use the, the NTP-based 
uh, interfaces for, for receiving time, for, for reading the time. You, you can decode it. It gives you enough flags to, to tell you what's going on, and you can work out what the time really is. Uh, and I, I produce a module to do that all the time in UTC now. Um, so, so in a, a UTC, sorry, in a leap second event, if you were printing the second value out on your Linux machine, it would show the same value for two seconds. Right. Uh, yeah, if, if you're just printing out the, the raw Unix time value, you will get repeats uh, during a leap second. Um, it gets a lot less confusing <laughs> if you're printing out a fractional version of it. If you just print out the integer, it, it goes fairly haywire. Uh, but if, if you show fractions, then there's, there's a defined, definite point at which it jumps back by one. Um, in, in principle, you could uh, get what it's time to, to agree with UTC much better by using UTC SLS or something like that. But I, I don't know of any Unix that does that. Uh, I, I think officially we're out of time. There, there is actually someone <laughs> to do on next. So uh, thank you all for listening. <laughs>